All right, so welcome back. Uh, before we jump into the continuation of the parameter estimation, like I promised, I'm going to share one reference solution, which I also released today on Colab. Uh, I cannot post this to the public page because, you know, the assignments are also posted there, so it makes no sense to post solutions as well. Uh, but you'll have access to this PDF that I'm going to describe. And so if you recall your worksheet, which is getting uh, graded, um, um, right now, uh, the idea was to model this single zone or uh, one zone, and I'm going to just share one solution. Right? As we already discussed, there is no global correct solution. It's a modeling choice, and uh, you know if you have done something different from what I discussed, it can still be correct. So don't panic. Um, but let me just go over sort of what my solution was. Right? And let me switch to that was better. So, so here's my RC model, and some of the things they may seem um, kind of hold on. Yeah, some of the some of the things they may seem familiar, which is the three R two C branches that we sort of spend so much time understanding. But then you'll see I've done some weird stuff as well. I'm going to describe why my rationale for doing that is. So let's look at the most sort of uh, easy to interpret part is this left branch. This is, uh, as min, you may recall, the node is not labeled here, but this should be ambient temperature. So this is my external wall. Right? This is a 3R2C model. This is the outside surface of the external wall, which is exposed to incident solar. Uh, then the wall has some thermal mass and conductivity or resistance, and this is the inside surface of the external wall. Uh, and so uh, if I recall correctly, the zone only has one surface, which is sort of the outside uh, external wall. So this is consistent with what we studied. Uh, let's look at the floor. The floor seems to be a weird version of the 3R2C. Because if you think about, if you model the floor as a slab, and then you model the boundary condition of the, out, the bottom surface of that slab as ground temperature, uh, we sort of, you know, very briefly touched upon this. There will be a conduction between the ground and the bottom surface of the floor. But that requires you to know the material of the ground to, to estimate that you know, uh, conduction resistance. And what I did was I said, let me just assume that the bottom surface of the floor is the ground temperature. Okay, it's a reasonable mathematical assumption. So that's why you don't see another capacitor here. My boundary condition is the bottom surface of the floor, which is at the ground temperature. The floor has a mass still, which is captured by a single capacitor now, and it has the the slab has some resistance. Okay, so this is my model, and it's a deviation from the 3R2C. What is the deviation here? You know, what is this resistor in the external wall? It's a convection coefficient. For the floor, what does this coefficient mean? There's no convection because there's no fluid. There has to be a conduction coefficient, but how do we estimate that? So let me just assume for the sake of simplicity that the boundary condition driving the temperature of the floor is the surface temperature of the slab itself. Okay? The similar sort of thing you'll see occur in, well, well, let me get to the ceiling first. So I have simply used the fact that the plenum temperature is being given to me as an input, so I don't need to worry about the ceiling slab itself. Because if you have to model the zone, the zone is getting driven by the plenum temperature. So my ceiling is actually like a window in some sense. It doesn't have any thermal mass. So you simply uh, use the resistance of the plenum, or you can use. If you have created a 3R2C model for this part as well, it's fine. Okay? It's not a wrong model, but here I'm avoiding extra work. Um, this is the window. In fact, the resistance of the window, I assume, would be a combination of both the resistance of the window plus the resistance of the door, because they are just glass surfaces. Right, so in this zone, the door and window are glass, so you calculate their uh, resistance in parallel or in series, that's a thing you have to figure out, and the driving condition is outside temperature. We have some direct heat gains which are directly applied to the zone, which is very obvious. And here's maybe the most weird part. So first of all, just like what I did with the floor, before I describe this branch, I am assuming that I do, I'm not modeling each room separately, as is clearly evident from this graph. So, so I'm averaging the zone temperatures and 
creating a hypothetical internal ball which drives the dynamics of my own zone. And just like the flow, instead of assuming that the zone temperature in the adjacent zone will have a convective heat transfer with the outside surface of the internal wall, I'm just assuming that the boundary condition is the zone temperature itself. So I don't actually care about what's happening in the other zones. Uh, and so, you know, it's very valid to have this expression that most of you have, like, why are you doing stuff that you didn't teach us, or this is incorrect. So it's not, right? The whole point is, why am I doing it? Well, here's my answer. The answer is I want to minimize the number of parameters and inputs and states of my model. And you'll see why. Actually, you already know why, because you have to estimate the values of all these parameters. So the larger the list of things you have to estimate, the harder the problem becomes in general. Okay, so the other reason why I want to show the solution is that the accompanying code or the template code, uh, which is provided to you as part of assignment three, it uses this state space model as the reference model for everything which is described. Okay, uh, and the rest of the assignment, you know, once you have this, everything else is very obvious. This is the state. I only actually have, believe it or not, five states because I'm assuming all of these weird boundary condition assumptions. So my only state is the inside temperature of all surfaces plus the zone temperature. Okay? My inputs are whatever was listed in the worksheet, but I'm creating a special inputs, which is the average temperature of internal uh, zones or adjacent zones. These are my corresponding RC values. Then you are asked to write the, the actual bodies. So, you know, Assuming you know, based on the slides, you were all able to describe the RC network in terms of these ODEs. I have five ODEs because I have five states. Um, and these are the state equations. Then you were asked to, I think, write the elements of ABCD matrices. So you don't have to draw these big matrices. You can just tell me the non zero elements. And that's one other way of describing a matrix, okay? Rather than drawing these big matrices. If you did that, that's fine. So we have all these non-zero elements of ABCD. Uh, C is actually just, uh, if, yeah. Should you be using Q dot or just Q? Say that again? Should we be using Q dot or just Q? In? All of it. What did, what was the notation in the worksheet that we got? I think. Use that. So my solution would be correct in terms of the notation because I didn't read my assignment before drawing this. So I guess just like in the previous homework. I wasn't sure if those were specific. So Q dot is so 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 yeah, you're right. They are heat flows. They are not absolute heat, right? So so the rate of change of temperature should depend upon the heat flow. So notationally you are right, it should be Q dot. So my bad. Um, yeah, so the vector the matrix C in the output equation, we are only interested in the output as the zone temperature. So so the, remember the output is some matrix C times the state plus D times the input. So if my state is this vector, my matrix C will be all zeros except the one corresponding to the zone temperature. And matrix D is uh, an empty matrix in this uh, model. Okay, so uh, any questions on this solution? Then the next part of this assignment is to fill in two functions. So let me just give you a quick overview. I won't go into too much detail. So the first function is called construction um, dot m. That's, a, uh, that's the function script. And the output of this, this function doesn't take any input arguments. It just gives you the output uh, as two structures. So the output is two structures. First is a structure of the nominal values of the resistances and the capacitances of the network. In fact, that's the whole point of this function, that it's using the geometry and material properties from the IDF file um, to estimate these nominal values based on the model structure. Uh, first of all, you know, while you wait for us to grade your model structure, if you think your, your structure is correct, feel free to use that in view of my reference. But if you want to use this reference, uh, that's why I'm explaining what this code is. This code is very heavily commented, which is why it's a long uh, file. The actual implementation is maybe no more than uh, 80 lines of code. Right, so the output is, uh, we want to estimate the nominal values. There's, uh, you know, some stuff I copy pasted from the idea uh, directly. And so what I have done first is I've already computed all the relevant areas for this zone. So you don't have to, uh, so you don't, you 
don't have to worry about any media calculation. You may need to still figure out thicknesses of different layers of stuff. That's not a good really hard. And so the main stuff starts here. You will have different sections of this code where, uh, for example, for the external wall, so I'm even telling you what is the layer information in terms of energy plus names of how this wall is structured, right? So going from outside to inside, these are the stacks of layers. For each of them, you can put, you have to mine the IDF file to fill in the thickness, the conductivity, density, specific heat. And the first one is done for you. You have to figure out and sit down and look at the IDF file to get all these other values. So I'm forcing you to open IDF files and run these simulations. Um, and then you have to fill in the value of your composite resistance and capacitor, right? So in my model, the capacitance is just equally applied to the state, so I'm just estimating the lump sum. But if you are doing something different for your own version, feel free to edit this code. Uh, the high level thing is every, anything which is initialized to zero, you should be paying attention to, because there should be nothing which is zero in your model, okay? So, so that's why don't assume that because some stuff is filled that I'm computing these for you. Uh, so, you know, for the internal walls, um, I compute the um, sort of the uh, uh, properties of thermal RNC values for the internal wall. Um, and then, you know, for the floor, we have to fill in again these values. For the plenum, I think I have already provided you the single value. You have to do this for the windows and the doors. And notice how, you know, the total resistance is, you know, I'm assuming uh, this collected resistance. You could even use parallel if you want. Um, then again, you have to estimate the thermal mass of the zone here. So I'm providing you some values, but you have to actually fill in this equation based on these properties of air. Right? So if you simply run this code, the capacitance of the air will be zero, which is incorrect. Right? So it's a pretty straightforward thing. It just requires you to apply these equations of RC and figure out composite resistances of the wall and the capacitances. And then the output structure, we have a structure called paranorm or nominal parameters. Uh, and it has two fields. First field is the resistance values and the next is the capacitance values. And so I would highly, highly recommend that uh, you don't change the order of these R values and C values because we are going to try and just upgrade your assignment based on the output it produces. So we look for a certain sequence of outputs and if your code compiles correctly. So if you have any additional resistances or capacitors based on your model structure that you want to edit this code, just append this, append this with those values rather than changing the order. Uh, and so the same goes for the capacitors, just append them rather than changing them. Okay, so that's all you have to do in construction.m. You have to uh, esti estimate the nominal values of the R and C uh, parameters of the, the state space model that you submitted or this reference solution. That's, that's sort of, you know, the one half of the programming. The other half is, there's also another uh, function called model structure. And the idea for this function is that if you give it a set of parameters, say, in a vector P, and give it some other arguments, which is the number of states and number of inputs, it will output the ABCD matrices of the state space as a function of the parameter P. Right, so we have discussed this, that we need to estimate the output as a function of parameters. To estimate the output, we need to first estimate the ABCD as a function of parameters. So that's what this model structure does. Again, uh, the, the comments are very insightful for what you have to do. Um, you know, the input is a vector P. This is a vector of all unknown parameters. Uh, and the output are matrices ABCD with the correct dimensions. Um, so based on my construction data, and this is what my vector P looks like. Okay, so P is a vector of unknown values, and I have to specify the ABCD matrices as a, um, you know, how they depend upon these unknown parameters. So once again, I initialize all the matrices to be zeros or ones based on how we want to output stuff, and I'm only, uh, you know, expressing certain non-zero elements as a function of the parameter. So don't make the mistake of using this notation of R and C when you specify the elements. You want to specify the non-zero elements of our matrices as a function of parameters, not a function of your nominal value. Because these parameters will get updated when you do the search and nonlinear estimation. Okay, so you have to again submit this model structure data. And these, as you would have guessed, are building the correct 
uh, model structure and estimating the nominal values are two things we need to eventually do parameter estimation. Yes? Then, do you care if we do it based on yours or ours? No, I don't. So okay. let me be very clear, I do, I'm not forcing my model uh, you know, to, as being the correct solution. You can stand by our models, which you should. So, um, but you know, we will evaluate, like based on your model, I can look up your model structure and see if there are any discrepancies or uh, mistakes in the, in the implementation. So any questions on what you have to do for assignment two? It's due next Tuesday, not, not this week. Yeah. I mean, I think like mine is like correct, but yours is like fewer sure. programs. Yeah, you so feel free to switch. Okay. There are no judgments being okay. made. The whole point is you have to understand how we use the physics principles to describe the model. And now we have to not just you know, be happy with the concept. We, I want you to implement it and estimate it. So, so as long as we have some reference model, you will still can um, learn the, the fundamental principle. All right, good. So let's jump back into the lecture. So, so previously we sort of stopped our discussion uh, on this idea that how can we use this state space structure to propagate um, the output estimation based on this idea that we know the initial state and the sequence of inputs, you can estimate any output from 1 to n. So that gave us the estimate by that. Uh, and then the whole idea was that in nonlinear estimation, you want to minimize the error function, which is the ground truth minus your estimate. Uh, and that error expression, when we do least squares nonlinear estimation on them, there's a problem because the sensitivity is not a function, is, is a function of the parameters of the model itself. And so what we were discussing was this idea of steepest descent that uh, we take the derivative, or we, we start with a guess, and now you know what a guess means because you are going to do that for the next assignment. Uh, and so the, the way these nonlinear estimation algorithms work is by iteratively improving your estimate of the parameters. So you give it a guess, it's going to evaluate what is the sum of square errors at that value of the nonlinear function. And based on some property of the function itself, we decide to update or do the search uh, in this parameter space. So in steepest descent, as the name suggests, the update rule was uh, at any given point, you can compute the derivative of your nonlinear function. Uh, and even though the derivative will contain some terms which depend on the parameters themselves, since we are computing this at any point, you will have some value of those parameters. So you can numerically compute what you call the gradient of this function at any point. Uh, and steepest descent dictates that the update to the parameter of the function is in the direction and magnitude of the steepest descent or the gradient of the, of the slope. Right, so visually that looks like this. Uh, and, you know, we try to, I try to give you some intuition in terms of what is the level set of a function. Um, and we had some review as well. So this was sort of the main point of what steepest descent is. So for any of these algorithms which are iterative, right, so you are continuously updating your estimates, uh, there's always an obvious question that how do you decide when to stop iterating? Okay, how do you decide that you actually get a good enough estimate of your parameters? So this is a very generic question of stopping criteria and any recursive iterative algorithm will have to have some stopping criteria. So one very simple one is shown here. There are others that I will talk about in, uh, in some detail a little later. So this is that I just decide that I'm going to have some maximum number of iterations that I think are enough. Okay, so let's say 10,000 10, iterations should be enough for you to navigate to some estimate. So you simply, you know, keep updating the estimate of your parameters with the magnitude of the gradient of the function uh, until you exhaust your number of trials or the number of steps that you have done this. And there could be some other ways to stop as well that you look at later. Right, so this was the simplest thing that we can do and it will sort of, you know, do a good job for nonlinear parameter estimation. Um, and, the, you know, this is again, I haven't shown you this function, but one of the properties of steepest descent is, you know, it has this uh, uh, behavior of doing, going in the zigzag path, uh, 
uh, unlike say in linear estimation where you have a one shot single step to the minimum of the parabola, here you have to make these zigzag uh, increments in the direction of the steepest descent to get to some uh, convergence or exhaust the number of iterations. And so, so uh, you know, this, this algorithm is clever, but it still suffers from this problem that if you have a function which is as complex as the one shown in this slide, this function has a lot of points where the derivative is zero, or these are saddle points or zero slope, call it what you will. And so, you know, this function is always moving in the steepest descent gradient. Once it hits a point where the gradient is zero, the parameters will not update. Or if it's in the neighborhood of the saddle point, the update will be very minuscule because the slope or the gradient is almost zero. So it can get trapped in these local estimates, right? So this function has some maybe global minimum right in the center, but because it has too many values, uh, based on your initial guess and this exploration of steepest descent, you can get stuck in one of the local optimal solutions, but globally that's not optimal. So it's a very uh, common problem in nonlinear estimates, and I will tell you how, how there are some heuristic methods to work your way out of this problem as well. But the main limitation of steepest descent is that it's very slow in practice, right? So why is it slow? Because the update rate of your better estimate of the parameter is a function of the slope of your function, or of your uh, error function, right? So, so the closer you get actually to the optimal, the smaller your slope becomes. And it will take a long time to converge to uh, some steady state solution or, or a point where the error doesn't change much. Right? So, so, and that's because we are simply doing an update based on the magnitude of the gradient descent. That's part one, why it's uh, slow. Another limitation is because of this zigzag nature sometimes, if your function is a weird uh, shape function where there's a, there is a minima between two neighboring minimas as well, and this is something you have to visualize, I don't have a picture for this. Um, what can sometimes happen is that gradient descents will just hop around the actual optimal point, but never be able to reach it. Because the magnitude of the slopes are such that you always overshoot the optimal point, and then when you have to come back, you overshoot it again, and this keeps on going. This is called a Zeno condition, uh, and, and it's just simply stuck. It cannot make progress. And there's some other uh, minor sort of uh, limitations as well. One is that it's uh, not scale invariant, um, and I could have done a better job of showing what that is, but simply put, for the sake of completeness, if you have, let's say, uh, you have a parabola where gradient descent is actually the optimal thing to do because it will just give you the slope directly to reach the minimum of the parabola. So if you have an equation of a parabola, uh, usually you would just need one step to go to the minimum, right? Because it's uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it has a closed form solution that we saw in the previous uh, lecture. But now, let's say you take the same parabola and multiply it by some scalar. All of a sudden, everything is still the same, but your gradients have been also multiplied by the same scalar. So the, pro the behavior of gradient descent changes even though the shape of your function is still the same, but the scale of the parameters has changed, which is not a good property to have, right? So the, these algorithms which are searching should be a function of the shape of your, or the form of your error function, and not necessarily whether you are, you know, central, uh, normalizing everything to be between zero and one, or, you know, capacitances are on the order of 10 to the power six, and resistances are on the order of 10 to the power three, or something. So that's what it means by not being scaled. So obviously we want to fix these limitations and that's going to be most of this lecture. We look at our algorithm, see how it improves the previous algorithm, but it will have its own limitations until we reach an algorithm which works reasonably well in practice. Okay, so, so before we go into the improvements, let's just recall that the least squares is nothing but a minimization problem where you, give, you are given some error function, and I'm already putting my disclaimer that you know now f of x is an error. Earlier it was e and x, which is the argument of this function, used to be our theta in our state space model, right? So, so this is very generic, but in general the goal is you have the sum of squares, so f squared as a function of some parameters theta or x, uh, and so you know you can write the f of x as uh, simply f transpose f the same thing, uh, 
uh, the square thing. Uh, so you know, here we are summing over all m elements. If we just stack all the elements in a vector, the square is just that vector transpose itself. Okay, so we are going to be looking at this generic formulation that you have a function which is in our case the sum of uh, squared errors um, and we want to minimize that function and it, the only thing we know is this function is nonlinear with respect to x. So what gradient descent was suggesting is that you begin with an estimate uh, x of k and x of k plus 1 would be x of k plus or minus the direction of the steepest uh, gradient. But it has those limitations, so the next improvement over steepest descent is what is called Newton's method. It's actually a very, very clever trick. Um, so what Newton's method suggests is if you have a nonlinear function f of x from Taylor series, and that should ring a bell, I am hoping you have seen Taylor series at some point, uh, you don't need to recall that, but Taylor series is a very powerful uh, sort of theorem that any function f of x in the neighborhood of x, where delta x is some small neighborhood or, or, or a single point and a neighborhood around that point, it can be approximated in the following Taylor series expansion, where f of x plus delta x is the value of f of x at that point, plus the uh, gradient times this delta x value, plus one half the second derivative times delta x squared, plus so on. It will have some higher order term as well. So this holds true for any function, any nonlinear function, you can approximate it with Taylor series. So if you ignore the higher order terms, the, the powerful aspect of this Taylor approximation is that any function can be approximated by a quadratic approximation, right? So this is a quadratic in delta x. And so what Newton's method does is it approximates the nonlinear function that we are minimizing in parameter space by a local quadratic at a given point, and then it minimizes that quadratic. So the, what Newton's method says is that the direction that you update your parameters now is given by the negative of the derivative divided by the second derivative. And I'll show you where this comes from, but I just want to show the entire uh, sort of end-to-end -end result first. So we are still moving as a function of our slope, right? It's still a function of the gradient. But the magnitude of our movement now depends upon the second derivative as well. It's not only the gradient. That's what the big insight from Newton's method is, right? So, so in matrix form or in the higher dimensional case, gradients or f prime become this uh, delta notation. So this is what a gradient of a generic vector is. And then a gradient of a vector is h of x. Anybody knows what is the term for h, Hessian. the Hessian matrix, right? So, so this is the same equation that you will move proportional to the gradient of your nonlinear function, but the magnitude will be a function of the Hessian. So this is math, but one of the things I will always try to do is build the intuition behind why this works, so where does it come from? So let's do that. So just for clarity, by the way, if you haven't seen these notations in a while, uh, there are two sort of you know unfamiliar things here, or possible unfamiliar things. One is this gradient. What is a gradient of a vector? And then what is the second derivative of a of a vector itself? So I'm just defining that here. That if you have a function which depends upon let's say x1 and x2, so it's just two parameters. In general, it could be uh, k or any number of parameters. The gradient is simply the vector of the individual gradient. Okay, so we are just taking the derivative of that function with respect to each parameter, stacking it together, and that's your gradient in vector form. And what is the Hessian? The Hessian is you take this vector and you take the second derivative of this vector again. So each row will get a derivative with respect to each parameter, which is what this entity is. So the Hessian is this same vector of the gradient, and now the first row is you are taking the second derivative with respect to x1, which will give you this top row. The bottom row is the same thing with the derivative with respect to x2, and you can keep going. So the Hessian is a big, big fat matrix, it's a square matrix. Okay, so, so yeah, this is just to refresh your memory. Once again, you don't have to implement these in code, but you need to understand what these are. So this is, uh, you know, again, what is the stopping criteria? It's very similar. 
Okay, so we have a number of max steps and we keep making updates. Uh, Lambda I haven't described, but usually, and you can do this in steeper descent as well, um, usually people have tried that instead of just blindly looking at the magnitude of whatever is after this update sign, so in steepest descent you only have this delta F term, what people have tried is that sometimes, you know, because we have these problems of zigzag and all this stuff of getting stuck and slow convergence, you can have a parameter which gets multiplied with whatever your uh, optimal direction of change is. So I didn't want to confuse you unnecessarily, but, but this is the true equation of uh, Newton's method where the update is of proportional to the Hessian and the derivative of your nonlinear function, uh, and you can also scale it with some learning parameters. So let me give you a visual picture, which will really, I think, in my opinion, clarify what Newton method is trying to do. So we start with a simple one-dimensional example of this problem. Okay, so, so the arrow here is just, let's say, the x-axis, and it's a one-dimensional problem, and this is my uh, f of x, right? So my sum of squared errors is f of x transpose f of x, and this is the nonlinear function uh, f, uh, f of x itself. So what we are doing is, this equation at top, what it is suggesting is that you start with an initial guess, let's say x of k, and that will evaluate to some error. Then we approximate the nonlinear function f of x at this point by a Taylor quadratic approximation. Okay, so I, I fit a function q of x, which I obtained from the Taylor series expansion of f of x at x of k, which is this blue function. And what Newton's method is now suggesting is you simply minimize this quadratic and move in that direction. So your update xk plus 1 would be an advance in terms of the minimum of this nonlinear function. But you're not really minimizing the nonlinear function itself. You're minimizing its quadratic approximation. So geometrically, this is what this method is trying to do. Okay? So it's, it's it builds this q of x and then just minimizes that using, let's say, you know, regular gradient descent or any, any simple uh, closed solution. So let's let me give you another view of this picture in two dimensions now. So so what you see here is some level sets of a nonlinear function f of x, which maybe depends upon two parameters now. So it's a 2D version of the previous picture. Right, and this is our initial guess. So, can someone remind me what is the property of level sets of a quadratic? What do they look like? When we when we covered steepest descent, I showed you these pictures of level sets, and we had an example of a paraboloid. So what's the special property of uh, level sets of parabolas or quadratic functions? Yeah. Uh, is the is gradient perpendicular to the line? Is that what you're asking? No, I'm asking what do you know about the level sets of a quadratic function? What is their shape? I mean, we know that. Circle contour. They are circle or something else? Uh, ellipse. Ellipse, right? so, so we discussed this in the previous lecture that the reason why we can have a closed form solution of a, of a parabola is because the level sets are ellipses and so you can simply you know, jump to the middle point because there's no local minima or whatever. So in two dimensions, let me remind you again what this picture is because each of these red lines are level sets or contours of a nonlinear function which depends upon in this picture two parameters right given by denoted by this two arrows. And so what does level sets mean to refresh refresh your memory? It means that the function f of x has the same value on each of these boundaries. And we are just simply projecting the nonlinear you can think of this as you have a nonlinear function, you are taking slices of that function at different values and observing those slices from the top, so you will get this projection of the 2D curve. And so what Newton's method is trying to do is it begins with an estimate in parameter space. So we are in parameter space, this is the global optimal, this is my initial estimate. 
what it tries to do is it does this quadratic approximation that we saw in the 1D case. In 2D, we are approximating locally the function with a quadratic and then minimizing the quadratic. And so we do this iteratively until we run out of some steps until we get to the sort of minimum of this function. And that happens because of this update, right? So I hope the intuition of what we are trying to do is correct. The disconnect can still be, how does this happen in this equation? That could be one cause of confusion, right? It's not clear how these pictures translate to that mathematical form. But is the intuition of Newton's method correct? Uh, clear, right? We want to make these quadratic assumptions and use them to locally approximate our nonlinear function. All right, so let me address that last part of how do we actually obtain that form and why minimizing a quadratic actually leads to that update of Newton's method. So, uh, so once again, we use a generic formulation. We have a function f of x, and we are trying to approximate that function in the neighborhood of, let's say, our initial guess, which is point a. And so that approximation is given by this expression f of a times the derivative of f of x in the neighborhood of a plus the Hessian of f of x times this term plus other higher order terms. So uh, I'm introducing these two terms here. g is nothing but the gradient of f at a consistent with our Taylor approximation and h is nothing but the second derivative computed at a point a. Okay, so we have this local approximation, it's a quadratic. So why is it a quadratic? Let me convince you. Let's expand this part out. So I'm just going to expand this part um, out as you have a term x transpose hx. Uh, then you know we have this trick where this term is a scalar, so the transpose of that is the same as the term itself. Plus you'll have a term a transpose hA. And all of this is actually getting multiplied by one half, but I'm only evaluating this inner part right now. So the Taylor approximation of f of x at a point can be written as f of a plus the gradient of f of a, which is simply g in this notation, times the you know, x minus a term plus one half times this term. So what we can do now is we can define a new function q of x, which is simply this expression evaluated up. Right, so, so in this Q of X, we have one term which is X transpose HX times half, that's the first term. Then we can collect all the terms which get multiplied by X itself. So you'll have a term G transpose X from here, and from here you'll have a term A transpose H. So I have combined all of that into a single, no another notation called B, because I want to simply show this quadratic nature of Q of X. So B is nothing but G minus uh, H, this should be transpose A, which is coming from just collecting terms which get multiplied by X. And then C is nothing but all the terms which don't depend upon X. So this is still just algebraic manipulation of the Taylor series. Now you have a local quadratic approximation, Q of X, which is an approximation of F of X at a point A. So what, what, what does Newton suggest, uh, Newton's method suggests we do next? we minimize the local quadratic approximation. We already know how to do that. We set the derivative to zero. So let's take the derivative of Q with respect to X. So this is like an X squared term. So the only thing remaining would be H of X. This only thing remaining would be B. We set the derivative to zero and the solution becomes X is the inverse of the uh, H matrix times B. Let's plug in the value of B again. B was nothing but this expression, so when this gets multiplied by H inverse, you get a negative H inverse G, and H inverse times H is identity, so the only thing remains is A. So when you solve this, you get A minus H inverse G equals zero. And so your so solution of X, which minimizes the local approximation, becomes A minus H inverse G. But what is H inverse? It's the, it's the Hessian and g is the derivative. So you're, what you're saying is the same thing that Newton's method is. So by minimizing the local approximation of the Taylor series, you can actually derive the update equation for the Newton's method for any generic function. So let me pause again because there were a lot of, I mean, it's pretty clear, but if you have questions, now is a good time. Yeah. 
So, if there are no questions, let me proceed. One of the things that we've consistently hand waved over is we are minimizing a function, setting it to zero, and just assuming that's the minimum. But the correct, cal from calculus, we know that the correct definition of a minima is that the second derivative should be also positive. So for a change, let's actually see what implications does that part have on all of these methods. Right? So for minima, we know that the gradient is zero, which has this form. But we also want to verify that the second derivative should be positive. So what's the second derivative of our local approximation? We take the derivative of this again with respect to x, and we are only left with the matrix H. So for the solution of the Newton's method to be an actual minima or a, or a step towards the minima, we have this requirement that the matrix H should be positive. And from matrix algebra, anyone knows what PSD means? What is the yeah? Yeah. So, what what is the equivalent of saying that a matrix is, matrix is positive? You can't just simply say that every element of the matrix has to be greater than zero. That's not the definition of a matrix being positive. So, when you this is a sort of a uh, you know uh, tangential discussion, but if you haven't seen this, let me at least define it for you. When we say a matrix is positive, the actual terminology is that a matrix could be positive definite or positive semi-definite. Uh, the semi only comes if there is a greater than equal to uh, term uh, as opposed to a strict inequality. But what does it mean for a matrix to be positive definite or positive semi definite? Let's say you have a matrix Q in general. If for any vector z, the quantity z transpose Qz, which would be a scalar, because you can choose z such that you know it matches to the dimensions of Q. So this quantity z transpose qz, if this is always greater than zero, then the matrix Q is positive semi-definite. Okay, so, so that's just a breadcrumb I have thrown for you to investigate if you are curious, but that, since it appears on the slides, you have to define it. Okay? So if our matrix H is positive semi-definite, or in some loose sense positive, uh, what we have shown is that the second gradient of this local approximation Q of X is positive. Therefore, when we set the derivative to zero, indeed we are minimizing the product. Here's another thing to note. The second derivative of our approximation is the matrix H. But what is H? H is actually the second derivative of our original function. So, the second derivative of our approximation is the same as the second derivative of the nonlinear function at a point. So, why is that interesting? It's interesting because what, what I said earlier, right? Gradient descent is naive because it's just looking at the slope and getting stuck in these zigzag pathways and slope convergence. The second derivative the geometrical interpretation of that is, it's actually a measurement of the curvature of a function. So when we approximate a function with a Q of X, or a quadratic approximation using theta series, we are doing this approximation locally, but we are uh, sort of uh, con uh, you know, conserving the curvature information, because the second derivative of Q of X is the same as the second derivative of F of X. So the curvature information is not lost, which is why the update step is actually a step in a good direction because you are taking into account not just what is the steepest slope but also how my function is shaped. Um, just to clarify what function is shaped could mean whether it's you know convex locally or concave locally but this again is not an optimization uh, lecture so I leave it at that. But this is just a, uh, it just happens to be the case why everything works out because the curvature information is consistent across your approximation. So actually this seems to be a pretty good method. Right? It addresses the limitation of steepest descent. So what is the limitation here? There are some limitations. What if our matrix is not positive set? The inverse of this second derivative. It could be possible that the inverse of the second derivative or the matrix H is not invertible in So you cannot compute H inverse. And even if everything works, still it's difficult to compute inverse of a matrix in practice. Computationally it's expensive, right? So I don't want to go back too many slides, but 
the style where I define what a Hessian is, the size of this matrix is going to be the size of the number of parameters of your model by the number of parameters of your model. So if you have too many parameters, it's likely that 2 and 3 become like a problem. It may not be invertible or it's difficult to compute this uh, matrix in practice. So in theory, the method is really great and genius because you know you figured out how to use this local approximation to uh, minimize a nonlinear function. In practice, we have some limitations. So the next improvement would be to address just these limitations and still preserve the same Okay, so, so once again, to refresh our memory, we have f of x that we were studying previously. But what is the least, in terms of the least square problems, the, uh, we are interested in minimizing usually not just some f of x itself, some residual, uh, where you know each term of the residual is some ground truth minus your estimate. And in fact, in the previous lecture, we saw how you could stack up this estimate based on the ABCD matrices. Right, so, so the the residual is a function of f of x in this manner. So what we want to do is, in these squares, we were directly minimizing the sum of square errors. So why don't we try to do that for nonlinear linear least squares as well? So instead of computing this Hessian matrices of the function f, which would still be useful if you were doing the you know, Newton's method, what we try to do is we define another matrix that some of you may have seen. That matrix is called the Jacobian. Okay, so Jacobian is the gradient of a residual vector. Okay, so that's what this expression is. To make sure you are with me, the residual is a matrix where each term is of this form, where this estimate depends upon the function f nonlinear. Right, so the residual is a function of the parameters of the model as well. And what the Jacobian is, it's a derivative of that matrix with respect to each of the parameters. So you will get this new matrix where each row is, a, is the derivative of the residual, uh, which is y minus your estimate. And the estimate is a function of your parameters. Why does this help? This helps because if we have to minimize the sum of square errors which the sum of square error was given by uh, you know this equation right here so sort of r square or r transpose r let's take the derivative of that with respect to x so when you take the derivative uh, don't worry about the square term you can have a one half in the front it will get cancelled essentially you will be left with the function times the derivative of the function so you have r times the derivative of r, but what is the derivative of r? It's this quantity called the Jacobian. So you can evaluate the gradient of your sum of square errors by the Jacobian times the residuals. If you take the second derivative of this again, to verify whether this is a minima or a maxima, just stay with me, don't get lost in of all this matrix calculus. We have this expression, and now I'm going to take the derivative of this expression with respect to x again. So we'll have the chain rule. The first term would be the derivative of this term multiplied by the second term, which is this, plus the derivative plus the first term multiplied by the square of the derivative of the second term, or the second derivative of the next term. And once again, we can say that the that the uh, second derivative of your sum of square errors is uh, this function over here, but what is the gradient of r and gradient of r again? It's the Jacobian. So we can rewrite this expression as just Jacobian times Jacobian plus some stuff which is depending upon the second derivative of the residuals. And so why do we bother with this? We bother with this because what the improvement over Newton's method is that in practice it's dif difficult to compute the second derivative because of those limitations of the Hessian and computational media, you know, it's, a, it's an expensive process. What we suggest is we can now approximate the gradient or second derivative of a function by using the Jacobian of that function. So, when your residuals are small, when this term is small, when would this term be small? When your 
actual estimates are close to the global optimal solution. So when your residuals are small, you can simply ignore this term and say that I'm going to approximate my Hessian with Jacobian times Jacobian, which is much more easier to compute. Questions on this? Because again, this, this was a lot of math. So to summarize, you know, we have Newton's method, which requires the computation of the Hessian of a function in order to make progress, but it has computational issues. So what this is suggesting is let's just approximate the Hessian using something called the code. Right? So, so, so when, when you are close to the solution, this is actually a very good assumption because these residuals are small and you can actually ignore this other term, which is why the approximation comes. So this method has a special name called Gauss-Newton, because Gauss made an improvement over Newton's method. Um, and essentially it's addressing those limitations of, of Newton's method. So, uh, oh, I thought these were animations, but, but yeah, so it's not quite insightful, you know, how do you explain their trajectories, but the, uh, I think the take-home message of this slide is this first point that Computing the Hessian requires a lot more steps and calculations than computing the Jacobian part. And it's a very good approximation, especially when you are close in the neighborhood of, uh, of, the, uh, of the estimates. So, so far we have seen steepest descent or gradient descent, Newton's method, which uses curvature information, and Gauss Newton, which approximates the curvature using Jacobian information. So we still have some limitations, and the only limitation now is that we've solved the part where, you know, the uh, Hessian was computationally expensive to compute. So the only limitation left of the previous method is that what if my, my matrix H is not positive semi Right? So, so in other words, Newton's method does, cannot work if we have negative curvature. Negative curvature is another way of saying that your matrix H is not positive semi-definite. Uh, so we can only make progress in Newton's method or Gauss-Newton if we can approximate this function if it is positive semi-definite. But what happens if it's not? So one idea is that when your matrix H is not positive semi-definite, just resort to gradient descent. You can always make progress by moving in the direction of the steepest gradient. The only limitation there was you could get stuck or you're not moving in a good manner, which is where we suggested that you should move in the direction of gradient, but in the magnitude of the curvature. But if the curvature is not friendly or negative, then just go back and start moving in the direction of the gradient. So you are kind of have this you know, adaptive um, non-linear non parameter estimation algorithm where you start by doing Gauss-Newton or Newton's method and if you get stuck, you just resort back to uh, your gradient descent method. So how do we actually implement it? One idea is that you can define the Hessian to be H of K plus some function times the identity matrix. So H of K could be the true Hessian or it could be the Jacobian approximation that uh, you just saw in the previous slide. And what we are trying to say here is that if the value of this weight lambda is very high, then you are approximating H with just the identity function. So in this equation, if H is the identity function, this just becomes regular steepest distance. Because you are saying that update my parameters proportional to the weight. So where does all of this leave us? It's the final algorithm that we will actually use, which does this by itself. It's called levenberg marquet algorithm for nonlinear parameter estimation. So levenberg marquet is nothing but a mixture of these two ideas. One idea by Gauss-Newton or Newton was, let's move in the direction of the local quadratic approximation. And gradient descent was the idea. Let's just move in the direction of the steepest descent at any point. And levenberg marquet proposed that, well, we can have a parameter lambda which decides how much of each of these do you actually do at any point. So it's like a 
best combination of both these uh, choices you can make to advance your parameters to make an any given point. Right, so visually, this is what is happening. You have your level set or the contour line, which is this dark uh, sort of black line over here. That's the level set of the function. So in this level set, you start, let's say at this point, the dotted arrow is the arrow that you would have taken to go to the next level set if you were following steepest descent. I really want to make sure you understand this picture, even if the math is sort of troubling. This is my level set. I'm at this point right now. So my blue arrow is what points towards as the steepest direction or the steepest descent gradient of my function at this point. My purple arrow is what the local quadratic minimization would advise me to do. Right? So if I was doing just Newton's method, I would move in this uh, direction of the purple arrow. And what Levenberg Marquette is suggesting is let's have a parameter lambda that combines both of these directions and moves in some good sort of a, you know, a mix of both these ideas. So the question always is that how do you choose lambda? Is lambda fixed? How does it vary? All that good stuff. Right? So, so, but visually this is what Levenberg Marquette does. It's a combination of gauss Newton or Newton and steepest descent. Um, so the idea in this algorithm is that we want to adapt the value of lambda. It's not fixed. It actually adapts itself. It's, it's calculating the local gradients and the Hessians, looking at curvature information to figure out when to decrease lambda and when to increase lambda. I could just go back, oops, go back, not forward. To go back to, to this point, if you increase lambda, you are just saying that go to gradient descent because your h is becoming identity. And for less value of lambda, even in the picture itself, for a higher value of lambda, you move closer to this dotted blue line, and for a low value of lambda, you stick to the gauss newton method. Um, and so there are these rules and ideas of the of the Levenberg market algorithm that will automatically adjust the value of lambda uh, to make the best progression. Okay, without you having to worry about it. Uh, and in general, this whole class of such algorithms, which are a mix of these two searches, um, they are based on what is called a trust region algorithm methodology. So uh, I just wanted to tell you the keyword that you can search if you want to learn more about uh, how the standards getting adjusted. But that's the, the main point of why we studied all these algorithms because each of them had a limitation and don't lose sight of our goal, right? Our goal was to minimize the sum of squared errors, which is a nonlinear function of the parameters of your model. Um, so now you know that if you can specify that function in code, you can use Levenberg Marquette to estimate the values of the parameters which minimize the error between ground truth and your model outputs. But you have to start from a good guess uh, of those parameters. So questions about anything we've covered so far. But I think now there's just one minor point left. So let's look at an example. Um, on the right hand side, we have a function which is dependent on two parameters, x1, x2. It's a nonlinear function. On the left hand image, you see the level sets of this function. Right? So this is a, again, like I think for the third or fourth time that we have seen the function and its level sets. So now it should be clear what a level set is. Right? Each of these lines, the function evaluates to the same value. In fact, you can actually even if I didn't show you this picture, just by looking at the level sets, one property is the closer these lines are, the steeper the gradient. Which is true, right? If you are near the edges, you have a very steep gradient. So the outer you are. And you can just tell that by this contour plot. So what is this example? The true minima, which visually is somewhere there, maybe at 1,1 1, 1, or around that region is shown in this star coordinate in the level set image. And all these dots are points where the slope of this function is zero. So these are sort of local traps for any parameter algorithm to get stuck. Because you can begin your search and if you get to a point where the gradient doesn't change and it's a local minimum, then none of these methods will actually get you out of it. So how does Levenberg Marquette method perform 
for different initial um, estimates of x1 and x2 is what this example will show you. Let's go to the next picture. Now, now you see only the level set. And I have three starting points. I have this blue circle, which is my initial guess. I have this red square, and then I have sort of this orange diamond. And you can see different iterations of the Levenberg marker, what direction and step size it chose at any given point. And we see that the blue and the orange actually go to the true global optimal, whereas even though you are starting in the neighborhood of this guess, it's not that far from one guess which led to the optimal. You are starting in the neighborhood of some guess, you are getting trapped in one of the local saddle points. So this first of all goes to show that none of these methods are foolproof. Right? They are not giving you the guarantee that you will go to a global limit. They are just telling you how to minimize a nonlinear function. It just happens that Levenberg market does well in this case. But let's look at a different view of the same phenomena. It's first of all clear what this picture depicts, right? We are just making, we are observing the parameter update trajectory in the level set view of our problem. Purely a geometric sort of viewpoint. I can now replot these things where the, uh, just what you need to retain is the blue and the orange did well and the red did not. So here's another view of the same algorithm. The left hand plot, sorry, the left hand plot shows the value of the loss function or the sum of squares of the f of x as a function of the number of iterations. And you can actually see that the blue and red, because they started in the same neighborhood, they evaluated to the same value of the f of x squared. And they actually initially had the same slope as well until something happened here where they diverge and you know something drastic happened when they went to and converged to the global minimum. So what happened is shown here. This is the value of the parameter lambda of the Levenberg Marquette algorithm. So remember again, high values of lambda means you are doing Gauss Newton and low values mean you are doing sorry, high values mean you are doing steepest descent. I got that. Uh, the other way around, and low values mean you are looking at the curvature and doing that quadratic approximation. So what we see here is that initially lambda was low for everybody. So you were starting with using curvature information, which is what you should do, right? So do, because our preferred method is always Newton's method over gradient descent, because gradient descent has all these convergence issues. But without explaining why it chose to change lambda, because it was summarized in that slide and that sort of requires a deeper explanation, you see the effect that in Levenberg markers, for two of these trajectories, lambda increased, making it more closer to steepest descent, which is why this blue curve especially was able to avoid getting stuck into this local, uh, local minimum. And it jumps out of it. This big jump that uh, corresponds to this you know, big increase over here uh, down step three or five. So this is just a empirical sort of experiment to, to again not just mathematically show you but build intuition for why this works and why do I need you to build intuition is going to become apparent in the next two minutes. Before that, one of the criteria we've already seen is that we just specify the maximum number of iterations for this process and if you exhaust it, you just stop. You don't actually get to see how well you did, you just assume that if I give you a million steps or 1,000 or 10,000 steps, you would do well. Another criteria is that when your error function has reached a value below some desired value, you can stop, even though you may have iterations left. Right? So why is this useful? Because you may be happy that okay, my temperature residuals are within 0.2 degrees, so I don't need a more precise model, I'm good with this just stop this process and give you the estimates of the parameters that lead to that error. Another choice of stopping criteria is, let me compare my error function with my previous error function and if I'm not making enough progress, I will stop. So this is an indication that the marginal benefit of re-evaluating or moving has lost, has been lost, right? The improvement between subsequent evaluations is less than some epsilon. So I should stop. So these are different stopping criteria uh, besides just specifying the number of equations. 
So to overcome this problem of getting stuck in local minima, one of the criteria is you start from not a single guess, but either multiple guesses or a region around your single guess. Right? So even though we are saying you have to estimate the nominal values of the parameters, you will see in your final assignment of this uh, module, uh, the actual search would be we will add some noise and perturbance to those parameters to give our model the best shot to get to a global minimum rather than maximum. Right? So if you if you cast a wider net, the chances you will catch the fish is, is higher. Right? So, so that's what's happening here. And you can choose randomly as well, rather than a nominal guess. That usually happens when your model is not physics based, but physics tells us good values. Okay, so uh, I'll stop here in just a second. I just want to give you a, a, a sort of a highlight of what's coming next. After you submit this assignment next week, we are towards the tail end of the first module of energy CPS. Uh, so, you know, we'll go back to the energy part from this generic model principle and state space discussion. Uh, so, the final thesis you will actually implement this nonlinear estimation for your state space model in MATLAB. The two functions you have to submit uh, for assignment three are precursors to one final function you will write, which actually does this parameter estimation. Right, so in MATLAB, there's already uh, a function called nonlinear fit, which does everything that I have shown you. And in the next lecture, I will walk you through each of the pieces of this implementation um, so that you can attempt the true parameter estimation out of it. So before I wrap up, um, I have some good news and some bad news. So what do you want first? <laughs> bad, news. bad news? So, okay, the bad news is that I am traveling and there will be no lecture on Thursday this week. Okay? And the good news is that there was no bad news. Okay? <laughs> okay. So, so, yeah, I am traveling to NSF on Thursday, so we will meet on Tuesday next week. Okay? Thank you, sir.